wokeness. Yes, sir. <laughs> it's it's really intriguing to me that the evolutionary scientists that I've spoken to have for some reason all found themselves on the subject of wokeness in society. And it and it's hard for the average person to maybe understand the link between evolutionary science and wokeness and politics. Right. So you want me to try to tease those out? Yeah. And wh- well, how did you find yourself talking about the idea of wokeness? Right. So it, it all began, as we mentioned earlier in our chat, when I saw the rejection of biology in explaining human affairs, which is something that I call biophobia, the fear of using biology to explain human affairs. And at the time, it was in the service of the scientific work that I was doing. I mean, what do you mean you're desk rejecting my paper at a journal because you don't think that biology is relevant to consumer behavior? How could it be otherwise? Mm -hmm. That's insane. So that's when I was first exposed to the possibility of a human mind, a human mind being parasitized, right? now, let me explain why I use the parasitic framework, how I came up with that. So one of the things that you do as an evolutionary scientist, when you're trying to understand the evolutionary signature of a behavior, you often will compare it across species. Remember earlier, I talked about testes size and uh, and across primates and female, right? So it was many different species. And that allows you to then draw a final principle based on comparing all those species. So I started looking through the animal literature to look for something that might explain why do animals do insane things? And so that's when I fell on the field of parasitology, which is just the study of parasites. But I wasn't looking for, because a tapeworm is a parasite, but it goes into your intestinal tract. I wanted the parasites that go into your brain Those are called neuroparasites. And it turns out that there's a very, I mean, it's almost like science fiction. It is a whole field of study that explores this host parasite dynamic where the parasite is trying to enter the host's brain, alter its circuitry to suit its interests. What is a parasite? So a parasite is usually, I mean, literally a, a brain worm. So for example, Toxoplasma gondii is a parasite that can infect human minds, but it most famously infects the minds of mice. When they are parasitized in their brains by this parasite, they become sexually attracted to cats and their sex and their urine, which is not a good what? Uh, yeah. So let me, let me give you a few examples. There's a wood cricket, an actual cricket, that abhors water. Okay, it, it doesn't like it stays clear of water. When it is parasitized by a hair worm, this hair worm needs to get the wood cricket to jump in water because it could only complete its reproductive cycle in water. So a wood cricket that doesn't have the brain worm looks at the water and says, I'm staying away. A wood cricket that is parasitized by this hair worm jumps into the water merrily to its death because it has altered its neural circuitry to suit its interest, okay? So when I saw that field neuroparasitology, I had my Eureka, Eureka moment, just like I did when I first discovered evolutionary psychology. I said, I will now use the neuroparasitological model to argue that human beings can not only be parasitized by actual physical brain worms, they could be parasitized by ideological brain worms. And so, continuing the metaphor, I said, so what are these parasites? Postmodernism is a parasitic idea. So, so postmodernism, actually, I argue that that is the granddaddy of all parasitic ideas because postmodernism purports that there are no objective truths other than the one objective truth that there are no objective truths. So, and the reason for that is everything is shackled by biases. Everything is shackled by subjectivity. So to speak of an objective truth with a capital T is nonsense. Everything is subjective. And therefore, I argue in the book that all of these parasitic ideas originally started with a noble goal. And in the service of that goal, if there has to be a collateral damage called truth, so be it. It's a worthwhile collateral damage in the service of that higher social justice goal. No, it's a deontological principle. It's an absolute, right? So you never pursue science 
in a biased manner. Freedom of speech is available to all. It's not, I believe in freedom of speech, but not for Donald Trump. Then you're being a consequentialist. So that's what the book is about. It traces the history of all these parasitic ideas, and then it offers a mind vaccine against that stupidity. What if the freedom of speech causes harm yes. to people and, r- and risks their lives? That's a great question. So I am a free speech absolutist. And so let me explain what that means. We didn't get into my personal history. I'll just give it for the re- relevance of what I'm about to say. I was born in Lebanon. I grew up in Lebanon and we escaped Lebanon under imminent death because of being Jewish. Okay. So my Jewish identity caused me to come close to being eradicated. Give me some color and detail to that story. So I was born in Lebanon in the 60s. Uh, Lebanon was historically referred to as the Paris of the Middle East, progressive tolerant Lebanon. Progressive tolerant in the context of the Middle East, which means something very different than progressive and tolerant in the West. And you'll see in a second why. When I was five years old, uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser, who was the president of Egypt, who was a very popular figure in the Arab world because he was what's called a pan-Arabist, meaning he was trying to unify the Arab people under one umbrella, right? To hopefully defeat the pesky Jews and so on. He passed away. When he passed away, when I was five years old, as so often happens in the Middle East, people take to the streets to scream and shout and burn and lament and so on. And as they were proceeding down my street where I lived as a five-year-old child, the the screaming was death to Jews, death to Jews. So I turned to my mother and I say, what, why are they screaming death? What do we have to do with this? Shh. Hi, don't don't put your head out, okay? So that was my first time where I saw, wait a minute, there, there are people out there that want me dead because I'm Jewish. Fast forward a few years later, we're in class and the teachers, this is pre-Civil War, okay? The Civil War started in 75. Uh, sitting in class, teacher says every, to everybody, please stand up and say what you want to be when you grow up. I want to be a policeman. I want to be a, f- a doctor. I want to be a soccer player. One kid gets up who I had known through all the years of elementary school who knew I was Jewish. And when I grow up, I want to be a Jew killer to raucous applause and laughter and so on. Then the Lebanese war broke out. It became impossible to be Jewish in Lebanon. We left Lebanon under very, very difficult conditions. Once we emigrated to Montreal, Canada, my parents, maybe they regret it now, kept returning to Lebanon because we still had business interests in full-fledged, brutal, massive war. On one of their return trips in 1980, they were kidnapped by Fatah, which is one of the Palestinian factions. Some really bad things happened to them. But then, luckily, through the connections that we had, we were able to get them out. Some bad things happened to them. Inside captivity. I mean, you can imagine. They were tortured. Yeah. Uh, my mother, and I've, I've, I've seldom said this, I'm only saying it because you, you're you asking. My biggest fear when I found out the story after the fact, I didn't even know they were, I didn't know that they, they, they were kidnapped as it happened. I knew there was a lot of mayhem in the house and I was asking what's going on. They said, oh, mom and dad have some business issues. They were lying to me to protect me. I'm, I'm 15 years old, okay? Although there was a kid at school, in my high school, who whose parents were very good friends of my parents, also Lebanese Jews, he knew that my parents were kidnapped. I didn't know they were kidnapped. And later I found out that as he saw me in high school, walking around and laughing and joking, he thought, boy, this guy is made of ice. I mean, he's almost, he's callous that he's taking it so relaxed. Actually, I didn't know that this was, he knew, but I didn't know. Okay. So when they came out of captivity and came back to Montreal, my biggest speak about evolutionary psychology and the male mindset, my biggest fear was whether my mother had been raped. Now she told me stories of whatever, but she said that she, she says, I never knew if it was true. And we only discussed it that one time and we never discussed it again. She said that no, she wasn't. Now, I don't know if she 
lied about that. She she said some other really bad things. I mean, I'm not going to get into all of it, but I've always wondered whether she said that just so that, you know, it's not exactly, you know, it's shame and so on. But I remember that if she had said yes, my thinking as a 15-year-old boy was that I would spend the rest of my life seeking vengeance on those assholes, okay? So it wasn't a pleasant upbringing. I could tell you stories that you wouldn't believe. It would be much worse than Rambo. So now coming back to your uh, freedom of speech issue and if it causes harm. I am Jewish with my personal history. I support the right of Holocaust deniers to spew the most offensive thing possible, which is they are rejecting a documented historical reality where 6 million people were exterminated. Nothing could be more offensive. No, it never happened. So you want to talk about hurt and offense and insult? That's it. But in a free society, I have to tolerate racists, imbeciles, assholes, falsehood spreaders. I beat them by speaking here, by telling better ideas. So the only context where I don't support freedom of speech, it's already enshrined in the First Amendment, direct incitement to violence. Okay, so let me draw a thing. I go, uh, I'm, I'm a, let's suppose I were a white supremacist or neo-Nazi. If I get up on a show and say, Judaism is a crock of shit. It's useless, it's the most disgusting religion. Totally okay, freedom of speech. If I say, later tonight at the corner of Lens Lexington and Sixth Avenue, there is a synagogue. Let's go to when they come out of service and beat the hell out of those Jews, if not kill them, that's not okay. Now, it has to be direct incitement to violence. So you can't say criticizing Judaism or Islam can create Islamophobia, bullshit. No ideology is above scrutiny. No belief system is above scrutiny. Your feelings are hurt, F off, grow a pair, okay? So as long as you don't say, let's kill the Jews, spend all the rest of your life criticizing Judaism, that's your right. Some people will say that it's kind of like, I was thinking of it like a staircase as you were speaking, I was drawing a staircase because if I sat here and I said, I consider myself to be a, a black man, I mean, I'm half black, I guess. My my mother's um, Nigerian, my father's English. But if I was to sit here and say all mixed ethnicity people like myself are evil, they are disgusting, they are vultures, they are vermin, which is some of that sort of 1940s la narrative towards um, the Jewish population, it's not long before if if me as a podcaster and many more of us all got behind that narrative, you would see this inevitable rise in people going out there and killing people that are mixed race. Yes. And this is this is where it becomes tricky, right? So for right. me, Joe Rogan, Lex Friedman, Andrew Huberman, all of the, you know, podcasters who have who have a sig significant audience, Alex Cooper, you name them, all started hitting a specific group of people with a narrative. I'm convinced there'd be a rise in violence towards those people just walking down the street and living their lives. Right. And this is where the issue arises. Okay, so then let me let me let me test your belief. You, are you familiar with the grooming gangs in Britain? I'm familiar with the notion of it, yeah. And yeah. I, I know I think I know what you're gonna say. I okay. think I've heard So up and down England, in every town that you can think of, big or small, for the past thirty plus years, there's been an industrial scale level grooming and raping of white British girls. The perpetrators are 90% plus on the conservative estimate, 90%, coming from one background and one ideology. Is it marginalizing and insulting to identify that ideology? I'd say it's not because it's probably impo an important data point to understand the causation of a, of a thing. Okay, let me give you another example. Um, American prisons are predominantly occupied by black men, or at least it over-indexes with black men versus the population ratios. So are black men therefore criminals um, at birth? Right. Well, that the way I would address that is I would defeat that statement with science. So I would say... Can you show me the data that suggests that dispositionally, meaning innately, what would be the mechanism by which 
uh, black men are higher than white men. Now, if you show it, great, but I'm willing to bet you can't show it. Therefore, what you just stated is a bunch of bullshit. And you know how you're going to suffer are the social consequences and stigma of being a racist asshole. But I, I let you say it, but I'll defeat your idea. On the other hand, if you said, uh, if we look at patterns of criminality in the United States, are black men exponentially uh, overrepresented? Yes. Now, we can say it's because it's white supremacy that causes black men to kill white people. Or we could say, could there be any causative agents that if we are caring, decent people, maybe we should talk about openly? Well, in today's world, I couldn't even, I say, I don't give a shit, but most people would say, don't even say that, that there's a greater incidence of black criminality. That itself is racist and you're marginalizing people. So that's why I don't believe in the concept of forbidden knowledge. Forbidden knowledge is the idea that there is some knowledge that should not be pursued precisely because of your scare, uh, staircase. It's going to result in negative downstream effects. I argue that that's a grotesquely dangerous principle. Why? So here I'm going to introduce a term and explain it, which I've mentioned earlier. In ethics, there are two ethical systems. There is what's called deontological ethics and consequentialist ethics. Deontological ethics is absolute statements, like Kantian imperatives. It is never okay to lie. That would be a deontological statement. A consequentialist statement would be, it is okay to lie to spare someone's feelings. So I always joke, if you want to have a long, happy marriage, when you hear the following question, do I look fat in those jeans? Put on your consequentialist hat really fast and say, no, sweetie, you've never looked more beautiful. I might have just lied, but I just spared my partner, my wife's feelings. So for many, many things, it makes perfect sense that we all wear our consequentialist hat. But there are certain principles that are foundational, that by the very definition of that principle have to be deontological, okay? Freedom of speech is deontological. The pursuit of truth has to be deontological. Presumption of innocence in the justice system has to be deontological, right? Journalistic integrity, if you truly are a truth reporter, has to be deontological. But what have we seen throughout the last four or five years? Let me show you violations of these. I believe in freedom of speech, but not for Donald Trump. The ontological principle has become consequentialist. I believe in journalistic integrity, but not when it comes to Hunter Biden's laptop. Because if we release that information, then, then Joe Biden loses to Orange Himmler, and then that's too bad. So it's perfectly okay to suppress what we now know is an absolutely true laptop where there is astronomical political corruption, but it was okay to lie. I believe in presumption of innocence, but not for Brett Kavanaugh, because you know he's a gang rapist going up and down the eastern seaboard raping everybody. Now, of course, we have no data to support that, no evidence. And the one who accused him one day before the confirmation said that she thinks it was 36 years later. It could have been 38. It could have been last week. I can't really remember, but I know that he sexually assaulted me. And we don't really care about this thing called evidence. A lot of my super fancy colleagues and friends said, oh, I know that we should assume that someone is presumptively innocent, but it's too important in this case to apply that deontological principle. They didn't use that word. They don't even know it. So in this case, let us just assume that Brad Kavanaugh was a serial rapist. So no, there is no forbidden knowledge in science. If you love the Diver CEO brand and you watch this channel, please do me a huge favor, become part of the 15% of the viewers on this channel that have hit the subscribe button. It helps us tremendously and the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guests.